Hello, my name is Carrie Toll and I'm the MLA for Innisfil Sylvan Lake Riding and for the Wild Rose Party. Welcome to my office and uh, I'm just here to say hello today. Well, it's been a very exciting year. Um, as you know, I was elected on April 23rd of 2012 and that was probably one of the most er, exciting days of my life. I have to tell you, I was never born to be a politician. I never attempted to be a politician my whole life. I worked, uh, you know, ev everyday jobs like everyday Albertans, and I I worked for Alberta Health Services, and then I became a real estate broker, and then unfortunately in 2008 our family went through a real tragedy. Uh, my brother Ron, who was 32 at the time, uh, jumped off the Bowdoin overpass. Uh, he attempted suicide and that's something I very rarely talk about but I talk about my brother Ron all the time on his next journey. After that day when he jumped off the overpass in 2008 he was sent to a hospital in Red Deer and basically what happened was we found out that my brother had Huntington's disease and that diagnosis was absolutely devastating to our family. Uh, we were told that my brother would have around two years to live um, and he was 32 years old. We were also sent on to the uh, never-ending journey of finding long-term care. And to find long-term care for someone who is 32 in this current health system, and to find a hospital that could adequately care for Ron 24 hours a day and give him nursing care, while at the same time trying to help my parents grieve, help myself grieve, plus get everything in order to make sure that he was well taken care of, was, as you can imagine, a, a very devastating experience for us. So from 2008, uh, I became my brother's caregiver, I became my brother's uh, guardian, I took care of all of his needs financially, and my mom became his nurturer. And so my mom would visit him every single day, and I became my mom's nurturer. So I took off all the burdens from her so that all she had to do was just go and spend time with her son. I took care of my dad um, and I would see Ron three, four or five times a week and make sure that he was well taken care of. I had to educate a lot on what Huntington's was about and at the same time I was a real estate agent um, with a very busy career and we farmed at the same time. Um, and so this was a very traumatic, um, very mixed up time for our whole family and a very challenging time for me and my husband, a very challenging time for my mom and dad and a very challenging time to watch Ron go through the devastating effects of Huntington's. So what happened from there is Ron passed away on uh, Thanksgiving Monday of 2011 and um, basically some friends had come, up, come to me and said, you know, you've been an advocate for your brother. Um, a lot of them knew I had written over 420 letters on behalf of my brother to try and get him a bed. I had appealed the decision numerous times and eventually um, had uh, gone to the media about his story and about how he couldn't get care. And so they'd see me as an advocate for him and thought I could be an advocate for the community and really encouraged me to get involved in politics. At that point in time, I really wasn't terribly interested. I had sort of ended this portion of my life and was looking forward to just getting back to my home life and going back to work full, full time. Um, but at the same time, as I gave it more thought, I thought, well, if the process for long-term care was as difficult for me, and I worked for Alberta Health Services for eight to nine years, then I could only imagine what it must have been like for other people who were navigating the system, who didn't have an advocate, who didn't have access to their MLA, who were getting shut down at every door. And I thought that that just wasn't right. So from there, I decided to throw my name into the hat. Um, and I went through a local nomination process where I ran against somebody. I was successful in that running. I became the candidate. And then, of course, we went through to the election and we spent that year door knocking and uh, engaging with everybody in this riding as much as possible. We held over. So our experiences with the healthcare system certainly opened our eyes as to, you know, where could we improve, how could we do things better, and what were the challenges that faced us as a family, and, you know, it could, could change, challenge a lot of Albertans. And so one of the things that we noticed right away is that our frontline support staff um, weren't really getting the support that they needed, that a lot of the resources are being used far above them. So the money is not funneling down from the ministry to the front line who actually do the care and one example of that was clear with bath teams so for example you have two workers who provide baths for all of the residents but if one worker is sick there's no one to replace so you go without your bath for that week um, that was just a clear example of how something that should never happen the other thing we experienced is is that there obviously paperwork is very important 
we talk about care plans and we talk about the needs of the client but what we found was and what I hear from so many people even today was that those care plans while they're very important they're not realistic they're meant more to make sure that the ministry is covered the higher echelon is covered but they, if when the person who's actually providing the care talks to you um, it's a much different experience. It's a much more positive experience. The frontline care workers that my brother had um, and frontline care that I've dealt with with most situations has been extremely positive. They know what they're doing. What I find very interesting is so many times RNs, LPNs, healthcare aides have said to me, I can tell you how we can make the system better, but nobody wants to hear from me. Or I can tell you how we can make the system better, but if I tell you I'm going to lose my job. And I, I found that, and I found that in this last year, especially as the seniors critic, um, to be an overwhelming statement for me. Because I think if we have solutions in-house, and I think if we have people who are working within the system right now who can show us how we can do it better, and if we can eliminate some of the bureaucracy and some of that costs that come along with bureaucracy, then we can get it to the front lines where it's needed. We can make sure that everybody who wants or is able to have two baths a week can have it. Everybody who wants home cooked meals and, and prefers home cooked meals could have them. That our, 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 our staff on the front lanes feel they have the resources that they need and yet at the same time we don't have 80 vice presidents in Alberta Health Services plus an executive branch. So of course, as I've never run in a political campaign, I was not politically motivated before I got involved here. I had no idea what to expect um, once the election was called. You know, you sort of get tips and everybody was free with the information of how to do and what to do. And so one of the things that uh, I was told time and time again is you gotta get out and door knock. You just gotta door knock, door knock, door knock, door knock. That was the rule. And especially for us, because we really had no money. I spent $16,000 on my campaign total. My opponent spent 76,000. So we, we, our total focus was grassroots door knocking, and we did. We door knocked over 6,000 doors, personally, um, and I can tell you there were a lot of days where people were very receptive, and there were a lot of days where nobody wanted to hear from you, and the last person they wanted to see on the doorsteps was a politician. And uh, so it was difficult to get the message through. Um, we did over 70 town halls, and we found that to be very effective because it gave you the opportunity to hear from the people. And so I enjoyed that very much. I enjoyed the door knocking very much as well. Even the negative, I learned something about the negative. It was interesting because the, the most common negative comment was, you know, all politicians are the same and I truly felt I was different I, I and I still to this day feel that I am different you know I, I I don't want to always give the canned message I don't want to always you know tell people what I'm supposed to tell them because that's the party line I uh, we have free votes so that helped but you know getting that message across to the masses was certainly difficult and I was certainly in a riding held by a former uh, cabinet minister um, who had held the riding for 12 years um, I never once at any point in time took it for granted and I can tell you that I never once uh, when I was door knocking on those doors um, never once said okay I've got it you know and even even the day of the election I, I didn't say that Well, election night was, election day, night, it seemed like it went on forever, it really wasn't that long, but election day was overwhelming, it was um, exciting, it was nerve-wracking. Um, it's funny how much work still has to be done on election day, and of course you're not allowed to go and campaign at the polls. Um, so we went and we voted, of course, and did our thing there, and my family was with me. Um, my husband worked that day, so he went to work and did his thing, and I headed down to our campaign headquarters, and the floriness of activity because anybody who hasn't been involved in this um, we know that y you you end up having your volunteers they're phoning everybody's trying to make sure you get out the vote and I just tried to stay as busy as possible because I just didn't even want to think about what was going on that day you know and I remember lots of people saying you know how are you feeling t today and I, I honestly was completely numb until about six o'clock and then six o'clock started to roll around and and you know, it really everybody starts to come in. You can't really phone anymore. You know, the polls are starting to close at eight. Um, you've, you've done all that you can do. And we knew that we'd given it our best shot. And so at that point, we sort of all started to, to just relax and, and realize that, okay, that, you know, now it's time to just wait. And that's when, you know, my stomach started to turn. I, I felt like I was gonna be sick. I was incredibly nervous just, just to go through the process. 
and I still had no idea. I honestly didn't. I, I really didn't know if I was going to win or lose or, or if I was even going to place, you know, sort of thing. And then the polls closed at about 8. And uh, within an hour, we started to hear. We started, the, the, you know, we started to hear from the scrutineers. Okay, yes, you have this poll, but no, you didn't have that one. And the first polls to come in were Innisfil, and unfortunately, I lost Innisfil. I only won five of the seven, five of the twelve polls, and Luke had won seven. And in in this time, in those twelve polls, you know, I'd be down thirty, up fifteen, down twenty, and then I'd be up five, and then. And then I had been told that I'd lost Innisfil, but I'd lost Innisfil by a total of 25 votes at this point in time. And I was just, oh my goodness, I can see that this is the way it's going to go all night long. And at the meantime, you know, more people have gathered. There's now about 50 people there. People have bought their laptops and everybody's watching a different. And I used to go back and check. I would go to the CBC site and I'd go back and check. And finally, I couldn't do that. I just sort of wandered around the, the campaign headquarters, you know, looking and wondering. But then we started to see a turn. And at the time we saw it turn, I, I had been down by 25, and then I jumped to up by 50. So I'd surpassed my, my opponent by 50, and then I never went down again. Then it was up, I was up by 100, then 150. Then people started going, I think this is it, this is, we've, we've done, but Sylvan Lake hadn't come in yet. And so we're all sitting there and, and just waiting, the polls are coming in, and we were all waiting for Pine Lake and uh, the rurals, because we knew if we had taken Pine Lake, it was pretty significant. Then Pine Lake came in, and I had taken Pine Lake, and Sylvan started to roll in, and everybody was the frenzy. And now we're 400 up, 500 up. And at about 10.30 that night, we were about 800 up, and everybody was pretty sure, but we hadn't seen the advance polls yet. And Danielle Smith, the leader of the Wild Rose, had phoned me at 10.30, and a lot of other people had already, you know, been decided on. And I answered the phone and the room went quiet because the leader is on the phone. And she said, how are you doing? <laughs> and I said, good, you know, <laughs> meanwhile I'm going to be sick. And she said, you're in. And I, I, I said, no, no, I'm not. And she said, no, elections, it's done. You, you're, you've won by a one, wide enough margin. There's not enough vote capacity left. You've taken, taken in a self Silver Lake. And I just started to you know tear and laugh and and uh, it's funny she was still talking I have no idea to this day what she said I sort of just blanked out and I remember saying to her well my check mark isn't on the TV yet and I wouldn't believe it until it came onto the TV but at that point in time the group really came together um, it was overwhelming and exciting I was just so 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 happy and so we ended up staying there till two in the morning and then we started doing interviews and people were asking me, you know, how do you feel? And it, it was so hard to put into words because I was just so excited to be, the, to be the representative of this riding, to be the voice of the constituents and, and to show them that they made the right choice. And, um, you know, I've spent the last year dedicated to that. But I, I have to tell you, I went home that night and at two o'clock in the morning, you know, I couldn't sleep. But about four o'clock in the morning, I, I poked my husband and I said, oh my God, I'm the MLA for Innisfil Sylvan Lake. And my husband kind of said, you're just figuring that out now? And I'm like, what did I just do? You know, like, the, and the amount of responsibility all of a sudden just weighed me down and I could not sleep. I, I, I got up at that point in time and I, I made lists, long lists about my responsibilities to the people. There's no question that the learning curve has been huge for me as it is for every new MLA. And I have to say probably the biggest part was the balance between making sure that you're doing the right thing for constituents, but also making sure that, that the image or what you're saying in the house matches with the voters that you're representing. And so far I've been very lucky at doing that, but I find that, um, very difficult to know what is what is the the line you know at how you do that the other biggest part was of course learning parliamentary procedure you know how does a bill get passed how many times can you speak to a bill you know what a second reading meeting versus third reading versus committee of the whole that was a lot and 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 what it means to be recorded that every statement you make in the house is now recorded and and can be used for good or bad again you know and and um, that every time you speak, someone is watching. Now, it might not be today or tomorrow, it might be two weeks from now, but to get that in that mindset that when you're speaking, you're actually representing 
the people of that riding and that so you have to understand that every time you get up and and make an opinion you're speaking on behalf of the voters and I find that to be quite an overwhelming experience. I'm enjoying every minute of it and I think it's it's something that I've really improved on over the year and I've got lots of improvement to do. But I constantly have to come back to this riding and say, you know, here's here's the issue. What's what side are we on here? You know, and I think that that's a very engaging process, but it's also very time consuming. What's the best way to do that? You know, and sometimes we don't have time. In the house if a bill is passed in 2 days, you know, four days, uh, you know, you only have 20 hours to debate kind of thing, then it's hard to come back and get the feedback from the writing. So you have to understand what the writing wants. I think the greatest portions of my life have certainly been this opportunity. I absolutely love my job. I love every day when I get to interact with my constituents. I love representing them in the house. And more importantly, I love my family dearly and how supportive they've been for me. And I love the community I come from. So.